Welcome to Valley Grove Baptist Church, located at 1731 South, U.S. Highway 281 in Stephenville, Texas. We are glad you joined us for our 1030 Sunday morning worship service. If you'd like to learn more about Valley Grove, please check us out at our website at valleygrove.net. Now, join us for the morning worship service already in progress.
you a half set, a little one that was up here singing your king to him somehow this morning. Hey, they did a great job. Amen? They did a great job. Thank you guys for getting us started in a wonderful time of worship. If you're visiting with us first time or just recently, haven't done so recently, we'd love for you to do us a favor. You'll find a Valley Grove Connection card in the Peapock in front of you. Grab one of those. Got a place for you to fill out some information. You can drop that in the offering plate. Let that be your gift to us today. We're certainly glad that you're here to worship with us. And we have come to do just that. To worship God Almighty because He is worthy. Amen. We as his disciples, as his followers, try to remember that he has commissioned us to go and to represent him and to do his work in the world. We strive to remember that by asking ourselves some questions. Have we said a good word about the Lord Jesus Christ to anyone this week? In other words, has Jesus been part of our conversation? Have we invited someone to come to worship with us uh, and come study his word together? Have we seen the need that God has put in front of us and met that need in his name? Remember, God has given us a job to do. Amen? He has given us a job. We hope to do it well. Right now, He's calling us to love each other in the love of Christ. So let's stand and greet one another just as so. Glad to hear this morning.
He says this in Romans chapter 12. Let me more give glasses on. Okay? All right, he says this. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. He says, just as each one of us has one body with many members, many parts, and all the parts don't have the same function. So in Christ Jesus, we who form one body, each member belongs to all the others. And he says we have different gifts to be used in different ways. What if the only sense we had was our eye? We couldn't taste, we couldn't hear, we couldn't feel, right? I mean, we wouldn't want to rub our eye on something, right? It'd be all scratched up, right? Well, what if the only sense we had was that ear? And we could hear, but we couldn't see the beauty of things, or we couldn't feel or taste? <coughs> so all we, God's given us all of our senses so that we can experience it. Well, you know, in the church, He's gifted lots of people with lots of different things, so that everything can be done that he needs. That's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Some of you guys, he's gifted with uh, the ability to sing and sing well. Some of you maybe can play an instrument. Many of you have a great heart to show a wonderful, exceeding love. And he's given us all things to do. Some are similar and some are very different. But he's calling all of us to use the gifts he's given us to bless the church and to share his name. Right? So we want to use whatever gifts God has given us, we want to use them to bring glory to Him. Can you remember that? Yeah. All right. Let's say a prayer. Yeah. Gracious Father, I thank you for these children and their wonderful gift to us. Father, we are beginning to see some, but we know that there's even much more to be developed. But for all of all, we give you thanks. And we pray, Father, that we will help live out an example before them that says the gift of this you've given us, we use to glorify your name. Father, we thank you for all the giftedness in the church, for all those that work and serve and teach and lead and, and do things seen and unseen. Father, so that the work for your kingdom gets done. We pray to bless each of us and help us all, Father, to use the gifts you've given us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Just as a body, no one has many parts, but all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross and forgive us of our sins. Not only that, but to give us the words of life that, that teach us how to be more like you. And uh, we also thank you so much for sending the Holy Spirit that, uh, that leads us towards you and binds us together as one family. I thank you so much for our Valley Grove family. Please uh, find Satan, keep him out of us and, uh, so that we can work together as one, one body. We all... We all have our own unique gifts that you give us, Father. Please help us work together and uh, forgive each other, being, being patient and, uh, and working as one. To bring glory to you, Jesus, not to ourselves. And uh, not only our church, but help us to work together with the other Christians in our, in our city, in our state, in our country, in our world. So that we can bring glory to your name, Jesus. Thank you. Please be with us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Standing in for worship, Brother Andrew. We got so much to praise the Lord for. The song talks about that, what He's done for us. Let's sing together, let's sing together the song.
Because there's very much a, a spiritual understanding that we come to in Romans 12 today and asking ourselves a question. Who's our dad? Spiritually speaking, who is our father? Who has authority over us? You see, Paul, as Jeremy rightly proclaimed last week, Paul has been establishing all this beautiful doctrine in these first 11 chapters. And he's been very clearly telling us that righteousness comes only by faith. Not because of something we've done, but only because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And so righteousness is only claimed by us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Him, not to us, but to Him. And so now Paul, as he makes this transition and makes this change and the things becoming very practical and very straightforward, then we, we have to establish firmly in our hearts and in our minds who's our spiritual dad. Who's our spiritual father? Who is it that we are going to yield authority to for our lives, our behaviors, our actions? Will it be God? Will it be us? It's generally just one of those two. We may put it up in another false place, but it's generally one of those two. Before, because if it's God that we have yielded spiritual authority to for our lives, it will impact us differently. Paul, coming to chapter 12 here, makes this presumption that, hey, it's only by the righteousness of Christ that we get to this point. Therefore, there's really no argument. God is our spiritual father. He is our spiritual daddy. He is the one that has authority over our lives and over our eternity. Therefore, following his ways is very clear. <coughs> because if we claim his name, we deal with it. study this morning out of Romans 12. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father that can be trusted in all ways. We thank you, Father, that you truly always want what is best. And Father, we yield ourselves to you fully and completely. Here in this time, we yield our, our minds, our thoughts, our attention. So come and speak to us. Speak through me, Father. May it be your words that are heard, not mine. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you again, Brother Jeremy. You did a wonderful, wonderful job last week. We're going to pick up where he left off. Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick up in verse 3. Turn there with me. This morning as we get set to begin. Now I will tell you from the outset. As I was... Uh, laying out sermon series and contemplating Romans was really on my heart and, and really the wrestle was between do I take and do Romans 12 in a series of about 10 to 12 weeks or just do this major theme part of Romans and just see what's happening throughout the whole book and I felt led to, to look at the whole book of Romans and so that's what we're doing but I'm, we're going to try to tackle something in a sermon here that's really designed to be uh, have a lot more time spent in it so I'm not going to hit everything. I'm going to miss uh, quite a bit. We'll come to that in the end. But understand that as we kind of fly through some things, this is deep. This is thick. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of it. Praise the Lord for it. But we're not going to hit uh, everything in this chapter uh, as rich as it is. But Romans chapter uh, 12. Let's begin in verse 3. Follow along with me as I read through verse 8. He says, For the, by the grace given me, this is Paul, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you are, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. Teaching, let him teach. Encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do so cheerfully. I've kind of got a theme for this first passage here, this first set of verses. I believe it's this. Die to self. As Paul begins in this talking about gifts and everything that we have and utilizing them for the blessings of the church and the, the blessings of God, the first thing he enters there with it is this. Do not think of yourself 
more highly than you ought. Die to self. You know, I went through and checked in our song list. It's not in, uh, it's not in Brother Rod's repertoire. Hank, or Mac Davis' is, uh, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. It's just not in there. I think I understand why. Because scripturally, that's just the opposite of what we're called. And we sing that song with a smile on our face and a wink in our eye. But the truth is, is sometimes those feelings can creep in. Lord, it's hard to be humble. It's hard to come and pray. It's hard to study your word and want to improve. Because improve on this. Spiritually, we almost come sometimes with that attitude. But the truth is, Paul tells us in the very beginning of the verses or the chapter that, that Jeremy preached on last Sunday that we are to be continually in metamorphosis. We are to be continually transforming and being changed in the likeness of Christ. We have never and never will arrive until the Lord comes to receive us and we in our glory are clothed fully in the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Therefore, we are to called to be constantly changing Constantly in metamorphosis, changing into the likeness of Christ. We can't be satisfied with where we're at spiritually. Paul says, never think of yourself more highly than you are. In other words, take a constant self-examination through the lens of God, he says, through the measure of faith that has been given you. In other words, look at your life, look at your life spiritually as God does. That word sober judgment means a clear mind. Being, it means being aware of what we bring to the table. My first semester, my first class in the seminary, they had a word in there that I, I, I had to go look up and, and make sure I understand. It was long and it was new to me. It's called presupposition. Now I understand what it means. You take pre and suppose. So it's, it's these, these suppositions or things you suppose beforehand that you're bringing to an understanding or to a study. That's, that's just literally what it means. But the idea is this understanding we, we bring things to the table whenever we start looking at something. Presuppositions. We presuppose. When we start examining our lives, we bring these suppositions. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing better than so-and-so. I'm doing better than so-and-so. I'm doing pretty good. A presupposition. Hey, I'm not what I used to be. I'm better off. Presupposing. But God says when we come to the table and examining our lives through the lens of faith and through the lens of His Word, we remove those presuppositions and we come saying, God, how do you see me? I know you view me through the blood of Christ and forgiveness of my sin, but Father, I also know that there are things in my life that need to be changed to accurately reflect Christ. What are those things? Have we not come to the table of prayer and saying, Lord, there's nothing I need to work on, so let's just have a little conversation to be done? But Lord, let me come in trueness of faith and introspection. Not putting myself or thinking myself higher than I ought. Which gets harder the longer we go. The longer we've worked on something, the harder it is for us to take a proper examination of ourselves with wisdom and clarity. But that's exactly what Paul calls us to do. To die to self and let God be the authority over our lives. And then he calls us to step up. And use the gifts that He's given us. He's called us first to step back as we take a look at our lives and see what's happening. And then He calls us to step up. And both of these are an expression of faith. It's interesting. He begins this, this section, this passage, uh, with, with the talking about having to lessen our pride, dying to self, not thinking of ourselves more or higher than we ought to. And He ends it with a contrast, but it basically he says, hey, listen, we're going to die to ourselves, but then on the other side, we're going to live to serve Thinking less of ourselves and more of others. The story is told of two men injured in the war and taken to the same hospital room. They share a hospital room. One window in the hospital room. The gentleman next to it was in just a little bit better condition. It seemed as he could sit up in bed an hour or so every afternoon and look out the window. The other one had to lay flat on his back day after day, hour after hour. Before long, they began to talk and they talked about to one another and their families and what they did back home. The man closest to the window began to describe the scenes that he saw outside. He talked to the trees, the flowers, tremendous detail. He talked to the ducks in the pond, the children playing in the park. One day he talked of a parade and described every instrument that walked by in the band and everything that was in the parade. Wonderful, beautiful detail. 
man lying in the bed next to him loved and, and just lived for those moments each and every day. The day he described the parade, he couldn't hear the band, but in his mind he could see the entire parade. One day the nurse came in and the man up close to the window passed away through the night. So she moved the gentleman that was farthest away from the window close to him. He was sad to hear his friend had passed, but he was excited to be able to look out the window himself and see all that was in the world outside. And the first time he could prop himself and look outside, all he saw was a wooden wall. You see, the man closest to the window was blind. He couldn't see anything but the beauty in his mind. That which he shared to encourage his friend and to lift his spirits. A gift God had given him that he gladly shared. You see, sometimes the giftedness is not what we see, but it's a giftedness that God gives, and He creates in them this, this, this uh, beautiful gift and this desire to use it for the blessing of others and the glory of God. Many of you have giftedness. Maybe others haven't seen, but you know it's within you. God has, God has placed it there. God has stoked the fire and desire that you use it for His kingdom. He's calling you out to die to self, to fear of using it or to, to, to selfish time, whatever it may be that holds you back and He's called you to step up and use it in a beautiful way. He's not doing that because He needs it. He's doing that as an authority of your spiritual father saying this is what I've created in you. And I've created it for a purpose. To utilize. Die to self. Paul goes on in the next section. Let's begin picking up there in Romans 12. Verse 9, Romans 12, 9, follow along with me. He says this, he says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This section I'm labeled, get real. Get real. Get authentic. When it comes down to the nuts and bolts of living out our faith, this is a beautiful picture of what it is. In the 1990s, in the middle of the Cowboys' uh, uh, great run of three Super Bowl wins, Troy Aikman is the uh, quarterback there, had a lot of endorsement offers. One of the ones that he uh, selected was with Logo Athletic. Logo, Logo Athletic had a... Uh, had a theme for their apparel. They made sports apparel, and, and uh, uh, in fact, their uh, uh, their slogan was "Get real." In other words, wear logo athletic. Ours is the real stuff. Ours is the clothes that the pros wear. Don't wear some knockoff. Don't wear some imitation. Get real. In some ways, Paul is saying that to the Christians in Rome. You want to know what authentic Christianity looks like? It looks like this: love is sincere. Hates what is evil, clings to what is good, is devoted to one another, brother with love, and all and on and on. He says, This is getting real. This is what authentic Christianity looks like. Clothe yourself in these things. Get real. Our spiritual father and authority says the same thing to us today. Get real. Don't play with imitation Christianity. Get real. As the authority over your life, you've been called by my name. Let me tell you what I look like. Get real. Get authentic. Live this life. And look at what that life looks like. Hate what is evil. You know, there's an unfortunate trend in faith today that we don't hate evil. Raising the kids as they were growing up and everything, hate, we always said hates. Hates a strong. Maybe you dislike something, but hate's a strong word. Paul's intention with the use of it here. We should hate evil. Not get comfortable with it, not be friends with it, not pal around with it, not say it's okay to live with it. We should hate what is evil. That's what Paul says. Why? Because evil is the absence of good. Evil is something that is anti-God. So we should hate those things that are against God because we claim the name of Christ. And it's His authority that reigns over us. Hate what is evil. He says on the opposite side, cling to what is good. 
cleave to what is good. We talked about it Wednesday night. I've given you the example before, but it, it bears uh, repeating. That word cleave is an old-fashioned word. We don't use it very often, but let me give you a term so that an illustration will always remember. You take a cat, put it in your right hand. You hold it over the washing machine while it's on the spin cycle with the lid open, okay? The cat will cleave to your hand, okay? <laughs> you will not know where the cat ends and your hand begins. It will become one, all right? Cleave. You try to shake it off. It's not coming off. It is cleaving to your hand. That's what Paul is describing here. Clean, cleave to good. What is good and right and beautiful and perfect, godly things, cleave to those. Let that so be that we don't know where good ends and you begin. Cleave one. Become one with the good. That's what we're called to do. Not know about good. Not study about good. Not understand good. But cleave to it. Do it. Practice it. Be one with it. Hating what is evil because it's anti-God. Cleaving to what is good because it is of Him. He says, keep your spiritual fervor, never lacking in zeal. Remember the, uh, the letter that uh, Christ uh, speaks through John to the church at Ephesus. Reminding them they've lost their first love. I believe an understanding of lost that zeal for Him and that place of authority in their lives. King David, repenting and crying out to God, he's asked God, he prays to Him, he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Pray this often. I think we should. Keeping our spiritual zeal and fervor, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Lord, help me remember what it was like whenever I laid my sin at the cross for the first time and the brush of your grace and mercy flooded over me so much so that my heart couldn't contain it. My eyes couldn't hold back the tears because I realized what you've done for me. Oh Lord, restore that understanding to me again today. telling others about you. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. If we as Christians don't live out these traits and these characteristics of Christ, who is going to? If the world doesn't see it in us, where are they going to see it? Martin Luther King Jr. made this statement, beautiful statement. He said, we must continually build dikes of courage to hold back the flood of fear. You see, fear and, and uh, a lack of understanding or a lack of yield or allegiance to God oftentimes rushes in on us. If we don't build these dikes of courage to hold them back and stand strong in what God calls us to do, we'll be flooded out and flooded over. A.A. Hodge, great theologian, said it this way, it's easier to find a score of wise men enough to discover the truth than it is to find one courageous enough to stand up for. It's easier to find a score of those willing to discover the truth than it is to find one courageous enough to stand for it. We've got to get real. We've got to be courageous enough to be authentic in letting the truth of God create that change and metamorphosis in us. Here's the, the chapter continues in verse 14. Follow along with me. Romans 12, 14. Paul says this, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written. Mind to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, thirsty, give him drink, and doing this, you'll leave burning coals upon his head. And finally, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I call this section Call to Die Self Again. And again. And again. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after him, let him deny himself, die to himself, take up his cross and follow him. Die to self. It's first. And it's daily. It's hourly. It's by the minute sometimes. Die to self. Again and again and again. 
Listen to the things that Paul says. These are things that are anti-self. These are things that are anti our humanity. He says to, to bless those who persecute you. No, we persecute those who persecute us, right? That's our humanness. That's our human response. Die to self. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice in somebody else's blessings. When somebody else is crying, go cry with them. Live in harmony. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with others. You know one of the greatest definitions of character? How do you treat someone that can do nothing for you? How do you treat someone that you can gain nothing from? Person of lower position. How do you treat them? That's character. That's your sign of character. Die to self. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. That's against self. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of others. Live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Die to self. Again. And again. I wish that we could just sit here and spend hour after hour trying to soak up the wisdom and understanding. Not just for soaking up sin, so that it can be authentic within us and we can live this out. That's not the time we have today. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take Romans 12 and I want you to read it every day this week. I want you to read it every day this week. I want you to let it speak to you. I want you to let God's Word be planted deep within you. And let these truths and understanding, these true reflection of Christ, wash over you day after day. that these truths become real in your life. I want you to pray that your love is sincere, that you hate what is evil and cling to what is good. I want you to pray, God, help me not revenge my hurts. Avenge my hurts, but let me leave that for you. Help me not try to overcome evil with more evil. Help me overcome evil with good. Pray. Every day. God has led us up to this point and proven beyond a shadow of doubt. He's the only one with the authority, the spiritual authority over our lives. The true. He is our spiritual dad. And as so, when he tells us that these are the expectations of our actions, we listen. We take them apart. We do our best to reflect them. Not because he's asked us to, as much as it is because He deserves us to do so in response to what He's already done for us. Who's your dad? And will you yield to Him the authority that He deserves, that He's earned? 